Matthew, you're the enterprise architecture and data manager for SA Power Networks. And when we spoke before, you told me just how volatile that industry sector is. Could you give me some of the challenges that presents to you? Certainly. So um, there is a massive amount of change in the electricity industry at the moment with the uptake of renewable energies fundamentally changing the way energy flows through the grid to things like electric vehicles and batteries again, um, meaning the grid is being used in fundamentally different ways than what it was designed for. Um, and what that means is our technology um, has to be fundamentally redesigned to enable that on the fly while still maintaining safety, quality and reliability. So it's a really interesting challenge. And where do you see data can help yeah. you master that challenge? Like da data is the key to all of these problems. I can't stress that enough. Um, in South Australia, we have a really um, old electrical asset. Most of our network was built post-World War II, so 1950s, 1960s and it would cost literally hundreds of millions of dollars to replace that asset base if you were gonna do it in the old fashioned way. But with data, you can understand to a high degree of accuracy um, when an asset is likely to fail, the consequence of that failure. And what that means is you can replace an asset you know, within a couple of minutes before it fails, so you haven't caused an outage to a customer, um, but not a couple of minutes after because you don't want to waste useful life of that asset. That's just one example of where data can you know, literally save huge amounts of um, money for the consumers of South Australia. But there are many, many other ways. Um, so for example, um, with the uptake of rooftop solar and battery systems, there's a huge amount of power flowing through the network in a way it wasn't designed to flow. And so one way you could deal with that is put really hard constraints on the amount of power that can come from a system. You can say, right, you're limited to this amount. But again, you, you're wasting useful green energy that could be applied to many other applications. So a much smarter way to do it is to use data to understand what's the capacity of that section of the network at real time, and then put that real constraint on. So again, you're protecting the network, you're controlling voltage, but you're getting the maximum amount of green energy possible into the grid, which then can be used for storage, to generate hydrogen, to be steel, you name it. But Matthew, I'm curious because yep. you're talking there about a data culture. Yes. And the challenge sometimes with the data culture, it challenges those people who've been working in the business for yeah. 20, 30 years, got their gut instincts, they yeah. know what's happening. How do you yeah. tackle some of those sort of, that reticent about trusting yeah. data and build a culture? It, it, it's interesting. I mean, I will say like data is like the hardest thing I do, right? You know, I've got a large architecture team, I've got a strategy team, like data is the hardest thing I do um, because it's so incredibly complex. And at its heart, you've got people who own that data, who live and breathe that data, and they need to trust the data. Um, so I think the key there is to take them on the journey to identify, well, who is the owner of the data? Who are the users of that data? Empower them to see where it's stored, um, govern that data. Um, it, it's really like data literacy and, and data governance is, is the fundamentally first thing you need to tackle before you can go and invest in really large data programs. That's where we started. The first thing we did was identify who are the data, like, Sorry, the first thing we did is worked out what, what, are, what is all the data we have, right? What are the data domains? Who are the data owners? Who are the people that look after the data? And then we engage them in a SAP and data council. And that was the real first step to understand or start building that literacy. And from there, you can roll out training, you can roll out quality, you can roll out lineage. Um, but again, I, I didn't ever see a retinence. Like I didn't ever see someone challenged by this. I think for the most part, they recognized that they were hampered by poor quality data because you can only, no one controls the whole bit of a process. Like there's no single group that actually doesn't require inputs or produce outputs. Um, and therefore they are always hampered by, so for example, our asset team, um, they really wanna know when a poll was built. It's a really important uh, piece of data for them because that will, they'll work out well, when's it likely to fail. Um, but the team who kind of install that data, they only really care about which pole is hooked up to which pole because that tells you the electrical connectivity, right? And so uh, data is a way to bring these groups together to go, you can actually help each other. And by showing that data model, you can kind of bridge silos and bridge process divides. But I'm hearing you say that the, the concept of data literacy, people yep. wanted to be educated. About they did. It. You weren't finding resistance. No, I, it. I, I never found resistance. I, I, we sometimes encountered um, 
politics around process and who own it, but I never once encountered resistance around creating more visibility of data, creating more accountability of data. Like when we rolled out, um, as in IT, we rolled out the data governance program, I was a little bit nervous to do it because I'm like, well, technically data governance probably shouldn't sit within IT, um, but no one else was putting their hand up. So I'm like, you know what, we're going to do it. Um, and I sent out the first invite for that staff and data council. I had a full room. Okay. I had a full room because people fundamentally recognize the importance of data. They care about their data. Yeah. And so yeah, I, I don't think you'll find that kind of resistance. I think you'll find confusion. I think it will be hard, um, but I don't think you'll find that kind of resistance. Well, that then gets us into AI and yes. AI readiness, which is all the data is the foundation for that. And, and why I first asked the question yeah. about a reticence, because some people can have some anxiety about jobs, and yeah. job replacement and that sort of stuff. And AI yeah. has some sort of connotations in that area. Yeah. But did you find the same support for the harnessing of AI yeah. as you did for the sort of embrace of data? We're probably not as far on our AI journey as we are on, on data. So we've been really putting a huge amount of efforts in data quality, data governance, and our data program for the past probably three years now. AI has only really kind of kicked up a gear in the past year. And when I say that, I'm referring to specifically generative AI. Obviously, we've been doing you know, machine learning and all that for many, many, many years. Um, I think it's really important on the use cases you call out and the big, the big bets you win on how you want to apply it, right? The, the, the task around you know, uh, building reports or making a workflow more efficient, that's more in the world of automation, right? And that will produce efficiencies, right? But what AI does, it, it fundamentally changes the game, right? AI shouldn't be used just to make things a bit faster, like it may make things a bit faster, but it, complete, it can completely revolutionize the way your people interact with technology and the decisions they make. And so in how we brand AI, those are the use cases we're after. Like one of my passion projects that is in its early days is, is fundamentally transforming the way our field crews interact with technology. So we have a large field workforce spread over 40 or 50 sites across the state, and they have about 15 disparate applications they need to do their job in any given day. Well, AI can unify that and it can put safety at the heart and it can make technology serve the user rather than the user serving technology, updating statuses and updating data. You can, you can shift the paradigm. Well, I'm curious here, Mike, yep. because you're telling me field engineers and I imagine blue collar yep. sort of uh, guy with yep. the ute going out into the field, yep. sort of that's, a, yep. you had to build friendship and relationship and trust with those sort of yep. people. And you, you did it through making their life easier. And Correct. Helping them think that. They are like your biggest advocate. So as part of this project, we've been rolling out really early. Um, we've got a really great user experience team. And so have been rolling out to these depots, doing persona mappings and journey mappings. And as part of that, we kind of pitch the vision. And they are so keen because they can see how much it will make their jobs easier. It's not about pushing work through faster, although they probably will get through work faster. It's about doing like, believe it or not, like field crews, they want to capture good data because they know the impact that has on preventing outages, reducing costs. Like people are really tied into your company's vision and your company's purpose. And sometimes I think we don't, we don't realize that and we don't use that enough. So if you explain to people the why, like why is this important? How does it get us closer to our purpose and vision? And then you enroll them from day one in being able to design that. Again, you won't get that reticence. Our biggest champions are our field crews because they can see the difference this will make. And you're enhancing the quality of the work they do yes. in the sense that they're not having to do drudgery, laborious yep. jobs. They can yep. they can be only targeting the stuff that has maximum impact. Correct. You're allowing them to do what they're employed and highly skilled to do. And everything they don't need to do, you're just making a, a seamless background task. And that's that's the game changer with AI. Like it's not replacing humans, it's making humans safer, uh, allowing them to focus on what they do best.